Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, so thank you, church family, for those who've been praying for me and my voice. I'm thankful for your prayers. I got one of whatever things going around. Also thankful for lemon juice, honey, and cayenne. Uh, can't recommend it more highly. I don't know how I'm speaking right now. I'll tell you in 30 minutes. Um, so initially, I was going to spend one week on verses 11 through 16, and uh, the more I read that doxology at the end, the more I realized, okay, we, we need to spend an entire week going through the attributes of God. And so this week uh, will be kind of part one of two. And so this week's sermon is entitled, Man Before God, and next week will be God Before Man. Uh, and so as we get into our text this week, I want you to be thinking and maybe you do, or maybe you don't often, but that our, realizing that our entire lives are lived before God. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. Everything we do, say, think, and feel is before him. And as Christians, even much more so. Because everything we do is in and unto our Savior even in our lack of faithfulness. It is a poor witness to our Savior. And so, Christians, this morning, I want you to think about what you have in Christ and how often do you meditate on that? Do you rejoice in that? Do you rest in that? How much of your day you completely forget and you end up looking like and sounding like and blending in with the rest of the world. And so what we're going to look at this morning is that the friends of God are sanctified in the image of their Savior. The friends of God, the people of God, the men of God, the women of God, bleed, leave behind their old selves. They embrace the new self. But I think as we walk through the Christian life, we don't always know how to do that. We don't always know what that looks like, and we have to admit we don't often do it well. And so I think here in uh, Paul's pastoral charge to Timothy, it mirrors the Christian life. And this text is driven by five commands. But I think often as we, when we read commands, we put the emphasis on what we do. But I want you to see this morning that sanctification, growing in Christ, the greater weight is not on what we do. But the greater weight is on how we can even do it in the first place. Why we do it. And who we do it for. And where it all comes from. So not just what we do, but how we can do it, why we do it, who it is from, and who we do it unto. That's what we're going to focus on this morning in sanctification. And so we're transitioning a little bit from the enemies of God last week the enemies of godliness, to this week the friend of God, uh, using Timothy as an example that really extends to all of us. Uh, and so John Stott describes Paul's appeal to Timothy um, to be faithful before God as one that is ethical, meaning it has moral principles and conduct, uh, theological and experiential. So I just stole uh, John Stott's outline, but I'm giving him full credit. Um, so his appeal to Timothy, we're going to look at the ethical dimension, the theological dimension, and the experiential dimension. Um, and so let's look at our text, and I'll tell you what that means as we go. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Man, I'm going to read this this week, and again this week, and then we'll go through it next week. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we don't cry out in doxology often enough. Forgive us when we don't proclaim your excellencies. 
when we don't confess even to ourselves that you dwell in unapproachable light. That if it were not from your grace, we, like Moses, could not even look at you. We, like Israel, could not even step one foot on your mountain. But by your grace, through your Son, you brought us to Mount Zion. We no longer stand before Mount Sinai. Through your Son, he has brought us into the holy places as an atonement for our sin, as a mediation and a new and better covenant. One whose high priest is eternal. Whose people always are before God. He is always before them who are united to Him for eternity. Who have everlasting life. Lord, we praise You for this. This is only by Your hand. We could never bring anything worthy to the table to deserve this. But we can only come to the table and say you deserve because you are worthy. Lord, we just ask this morning that your Spirit would convict us and teach us and guide us according to your Word. They would not fall on deaf ears. That you would till the soil of our hearts that we'd be receptive to encouragement and correction. That the saints would be built up and edified. That the goats among us would turn from their wickedness. That you would prick their ears and they would hear the Master's voice for the first time and run home to the fold. That Jesus Christ, our Shepherd, the King of kings and Lord of lords, would receive the glory and receive the inheritance that is due Him in the saints. And it's, his, it's in His name we pray. Amen. So in verse 11, uh, this is one of those buts that gives us a very hard transition from what we saw last week. It could not be in greater contrast to the opportunistic false teachers that we saw last week. Those who would see godliness as a means for gain. could not be in more contrast to those who lack contentment. Those who desire money so much that they love it and worship it and they let it lets them or let it lets it lead them astray might be one of those kind of mornings amen but this cannot be the church timothy this cannot be you i know we, we, we've been in first timothy for a while and paul knows you are facing opposition these people are in your midst but you O man of god Flee these things. The saints must be so sanctified and so unhitched from the worldly system that the, that the water is not muddied, that the purity of the church is not polluted. Uh, so I want us to begin in James chapter 4 where he explains this. James chapter 4, just a couple books to the right in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. James chapter 4, I want to pick up in verse 4. James is also in a dysfunctional church, speaking to people with divisions and sins and partiality and all these things. And these people are hypocrites. They are contradictory to their calling. So he says here in verse 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's why Paul begins here, but you, O man of God, don't be like them. Or do you suppose that it is of no purpose that the Scriptures say he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? For he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Here's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. That will be the emphasis of our text this morning. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So when Paul says to Timothy, O man of God, he's making an emphatic point. Prior to this, it is a title given to Moses given to Joshua, given to Samuel, 
given to David, given to Elijah, and given to Elisha. Pretty high bar. What he's saying to Timothy, this is a high compliment, but this is a weighty call. And so, as we dig through the Scriptures week after week, as we apply the Scriptures week after week, this is the purpose of the ministry of the Word. To grow the man of God. So I want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. These verses that we know well, and we often use for the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture, which we absolutely agree with. But I, don't think, we, I think we often miss that the purpose of preaching and teaching and applying the Scriptures is for the man of God. Here's what Paul says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That gives us purpose here. The man of God may, co- may be complete, equipped for every good work. So in that way, if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you are a man of God. Think about that. The title that was, that was reserved for Moses and Joshua and Samuel and Elijah and Elisha now makes us men, and by extension, women, of God. And so there is a charge on us, according to God's word, that we built up, that we we be built up for every good work. And so Timothy, here, is the one who leads the congregation. He must be that example. He must do it first. He must humble himself. He must take that charge. Because everything, everyone else is looking to him. What are you going to do when the false teachers rise up? What are you going to do when sinfulness abounds in the church? What are you going to do when people confront you with asceticism, with, with, with legalism, with anything else? Man of God, how will you stand? And so he gives the first two of these five commands. Flee and pursue. Uh, and so I want to talk about these for just a moment before we kind of break them down. Um, these are two sides of the same coin. You've heard me say this before, but we, uh, we need a, a refresher often. Sanctification, growing in Christ, has two parallel actions, two parallel operations. Fleeing and pursuing. We call mortification, putting sin to death, and vivification, putting on the life of Christ. The Christian life is a constant rhythm of, t- of putting off the old and putting on the new. Getting rid of the old wineskins. Taking the new wineskin of our new birth. Getting rid of the old tattered garments and putting on the clothes of righteousness. Putting to death the sins of sexual immorality and greed and covetousness and lying and slander and division and on and on and on. And putting on daily peace and love and joy and righteousness and unity, and harmony, and forgiveness, and grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ. This is the Christian life. You leave the old behind, and you take the new with you. And so this first command is to leave the old behind. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. What are these things? Everything we talked about last week. These enemies of godliness. Greedy false teachers. Discontentment. Love of money. Flee them. Leave them behind. Flee them like Joseph fleed Potiphar's wife. So I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. Because I think there's a bit of a misconception that our efforts must be in fighting sin. Like, I need to have this battleground. But it's interesting. It's not what Paul says. It's not what Joseph did. It's not what Jesus says. What did Joseph do? He didn't try to speak sense into this lustful woman. He didn't didn't try to reason with her. He didn't say, I'm going to stand my ground and I can stand here and not give in to your temptation. What did he do when temptation got close? He ran as quick as he could. So quick, he probably should have remembered his clothes. But he got out of there. Why? You don't stick around to reason with sin. You don't stick around to fight a, a fight you can't win. I want to look at what Jesus told us. Like, what does this look like? Matthew 18. It's interesting. 
All right, Matthew 18, beginning in verse 7. It's, uh, to me, it's interesting that this comes right before the uh, text on church discipline. Look what Jesus says here. Woe to the world for temptations of sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptations come. Now, now we, we know this. If you've been in church for a while, you know this idea, but I want you to think about it. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. He doesn't say cut it off and watch it wriggle on, on the ground. He didn't say cut it off and, and, and lament for the loss of your hand. Cut it off and throw it away. Do not look at it again. Do not think about it again. That is how we are to treat our sin. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Some of you this morning are here and you are holding on to your sin. I hear everything you're saying, Pastor. I'm watching all the things that these Christians do but I don't want to let go of it. I like my hand too much. I would rather hop into heaven on four nubs than stand in one biological piece and stand here with my sin and go to hell with all of it. That is what Jesus is saying. I am worth the loss of your eyes, your hands, your feet. Get rid of it. Put it to death and leave it behind you and walk away. And if you're not convinced, he goes on. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Jesus is being hyperbolic here. Or is he? It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. What are we to do with our sin? We don't reason with it. We don't try to make sense of it. We don't try to wrestle it to the ground. We cut it off. This is sanctified retreat. That is okay. That is encouraged. That is recommended. Flee from these things. That is mortification. Put it to death. Put it off. Have nothing more to do with it. Now that will make more sense when we look at the next command. Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. This is a list of characters, characteristics that please God and defies self-centeredness. Now, many commentators tried to come up with some kind of pattern here. I don't think that there is a pattern. I think Paul's doing here, as he often does, he uses a list it is not comprehensive, meaning it's not everything that we must pursue. It's representative. These are all good things. No one's going to disagree with this list. So these things, not those things. Leave, flee that stuff. Leave it behind. This is the good stuff. Good stuff. Where should our effort be? What should we pursue? What should we expel energy for? Righteousness. That which we have been given in Christ. That which is ours in him, that's what we pursue. That's what we grow in. Godliness. That which pleases God and reflects him in our lives, in the lives of others. That which is, is glorifying to God and is a witness to the world that we are of him and not of the world. Faith. Pursue your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not your own ability to conquer sin. Some of you have that confused. Love. You are so focused on what you are struggling with that you can't love the Lord or anyone else. You're walking around trying to save yourself. Foolish man. Steadfastness. Pursue continuing in the Lord. Not being deterred by sin or weight. Leave it. Flee from it. Continue to run. Gentleness. None of us would disagree with these. I think every one of us has a tendency to lean one way or the other. Because if you only flee sin, if your only focus is don't do these things, you become legalistic. If your only focus is I'm just going to pursue godliness and not worry about my sin, you become a hypocrite. We need both of them. 
We need to flee from our sin, put it behind us, put it to death, and we need to pursue, run after the things of God. We don't want to be legalistic and we don't want to be hypocritic. So what Paul's talking about here is pressing on toward good while you're leaving evil behind at the same time. That is sanctification. I want to be honest here for a moment. I think we're too often consumed with fighting sin that we never get around to growing in godliness. Anyone ever been there? Where all you think about is your sin and I've got to fight this, I've got to conquer this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. You become myopic, meaning you stare at yourself. That your sin consumes you and I'm telling you, you're fighting in the wrong front. The energy, the fight, is not with sin. Christ has already conquered that. The fight, which we're going to see in verse 12, is in pursuit of what is good and what is great. But if we're so consumed with fighting our own sin, then godliness seems unreachable and we don't pursue it. But if you are in Christ, he has given you his righteousness. He has reconciled you to God. He has made you able to pursue it, and he has removed the weight so that you can pursue it. But how many of us, like Pilgrim, in Pilgrim's Progress, like Christian, hold on to our sin far too long? Think that I have to bear this particular cross, and I'm going to drag my sin around with me, instead of laying it at the foot of the cross and walking on that narrow way. So we are to press forward, and the more we press forward, the more we shed sin. We look to the goal, we don't look from where we came from. So I want you to think about this. The more you pursue godliness, the less you are pursued by what is ungodly. Think about that for a moment. The more you fix your eyes on Christ and pursue what is godly and righteous and good and faithful and true and steadfast, the less time you have to be pursued by your own sin. So, Paul often uses military and athletic analogies. This picture is running toward the finish line and running away from what lies behind. Any runner, if there's any runners in here, you cannot run and look back at the same time. You will trip over your own feet and fall flat on your face. But how many Christians run the Christian life like that? I'm going to run a few steps and I'm going to look back at my sin. I'm going to run a few steps and I'm going to look back at my failure. That's not how we're called to run. You flee those things. You keep your eyes fixed on the goal. I think in, in sanctification, I've said this often, but in sanctification, I think we believe that my sanctification, my growth in Christ should be like this, this great upward trend. That I am, always, I am always growing and in leaps and bounds, day after day, month and month, I'm going to be getting better. Anyone have one of those, those, those graphs in their Christian life? I didn't think so. Sanctification is growth, but it's usually not like this. It's more like this or like this. We're like one degree of, of growth. But the other thing, too, is that sanctification is not a straight line. It is a pursuing righteousness, and I stumble and free from sin. And I pursue righteousness, and I stumble and free from sin. So we've got this, this kind of jagged graph but it is always pushing up the hill. It is always going toward the, 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 the vantage point. We have got to stop defining ourselves by our sin that Christ has already paid for. And trying to confront a tempting woman. Men, you cannot stand in front of a temptress. Run. Women, you cannot stand in front of the idol of approval or uh, people-pleasing, and think you are strong enough to get over it yourself. Put it to death. Run away from it. Stop looking back, because Christ doesn't. Stop looking at your sin. Look at Him. He nailed it to the cross. How much time do you spend looking at your own sin versus looking to the finish line? Looking to the one who has went before you. Looking to the one who is waiting for you. Looking to the one who has prepared a home for you. And maturity tells us when to flee and when to fight. 
Don't fight battles that you can't win and aren't worth winning. Fight those that are worth fighting. I want to look at Colossians 1 here. I go to this passage often because I love it. But we're going to continue at the end of Colossians 1 and into Colossians 2. This is Paul's uh, ministry aim. The focus of his ministry. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Him, meaning Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that, here's the purpose of his ministry, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Notice, that is what he pursues. That is the fight we're going to look at in just a moment. This is where Paul expels his energy. And it's not even his energy. When I fight, when I struggle, it's Christ's strength in me. And then he speaks to the church at Colossae and the church in Laodicea, chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. This is what I'm telling you. This is what we struggle for. That we and the brothers and sisters we walk alongside reach full assurance of understanding of who Christ is and what they have in him. That is worth fighting for. That is worth running. That is worth struggling. Don't run in the other direction. He goes on. To reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom all the treasures, whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So let me ask you, where is your energy spent? What are you pursuing? How are you defining the Christian life? How do you measure your sanctification? Is it a list of all the sins that you haven't conquered? Is a list of all the days you haven't read your Bible, and I'm not telling you to continue in sin or not to read your Bible. But do you measure it by your own failures or do you measure it by Christ's faithfulness? Do you measure your sanctification by a desire the Spirit has put within you that grows, even if incrementally, to love the Lord and follow Him, to pursue Him, to put on Christ every day? Is that our focus? So that puts into perspective verse 12. Therefore, it's not in the text, but it's implied. Therefore, fight the good fight of the faith. So the fight here, it's a word that means both athletic competition and warfare. I want you to think boxing. You are, you are competing, but there's also a violence to it. And this in the Greek is a present imperative. That means that it shows ongoing exertion. Ongoing effort. This never stops. This good fight of, of the faith, this is what we're in. Remember, we just looked at last week, there are those who are working against the faith and wandering away from it. We have a good fight of the faith. There is only one. There is one set of doctrine and practice because there is only one way, one truth, and one life. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 4 through 7. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father over all, who is over all. One God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul's saying here that there is a unified faith that unites us all. We all, brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, we are fighting the same battle. We have the same call. We have the same faith. We have the same baptism. And so fighting always makes me think about Nehemiah. I love the imagery in Nehemiah. You don't have to turn there, but Nehemiah 14, 4, or 4, 14 says, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Somebody make that a t-shirt. 
Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. I don't know the story of Nehemiah. Just lean into the context of chapter 4. The context of chapter 4 is that they've been given permission to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. Now the locals are getting restless and there are threats that people will come and try to stop them from rebuilding because they heard all the great and mighty things that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has done. And so what do they do? They build with one hand the trowel and a sword in the other. Charles Spurgeon used that as a picture for, for ministry. His, his magazine, which many have picked up on, the sword and the trowel, as a beautiful picture of, of ministry. The sword, by the word of God, we pierce the division of soul and spirit. We fight off enemies. We defend the people of God according to truth. We defend all enemies. We are ready to fight to the death for our faith. At the same time, the pastor also has a trowel. He is building brick by brick and stone by stone. A spiritual house is being built while the enemies are being fend- are fended off. Fight the good fight. We are not just on the offensive. We're not just building up. We are doing both. And here, Timothy has many opponents, as we've already seen, and he can't cower. But again, I want us to be honest. Many people, maybe you're one of those people who doesn't like the idea of fighting. Passivity is not piety. I'm sorry. And if you don't like the idea of fighting, so you cower and crawl through the Christian life. Yeah, I'm just burdened by my sin. I don't have any gifts that anyone else does. You, you eeyore your way through the Christian life. The gospel is, the, is always on the offensive. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have a powerful weapon against our enemies. We remember the words of Nehemiah, do not be afraid of them. Who's the them? The world, the flesh, the devil, you name it. Don't be afraid of them. Why? Because our Lord is great and awesome. Therefore, we fight for our brothers. If you're not fighting, if you're not pursuing, you are a sitting duck. I was having dinner with a pastor a couple weeks ago, and he gave me a great analogy. He's like, I'm going to steal that. Um, and so, Shane, this one's for you. Um, but he said that still water runs, or excuse me, moving water runs clear. So it's stagnant water. The, wa- the water that, that does not move where the algae grows, where the mold and the uh, fungus and all the mosquitoes lay their eggs, but they can't if the water is running. We are to be living streams, moving water, not standing still in stagnant ponds. I love that imagery. In boxing terms, going back to the fight, we don't want to get hit, but you'll never win if you don't throw a punch. In the gospel, we are on the offensive, and we fight to win. And growing in godliness is worth the time and is worth the effort to fight. This is the good fight, our faith. But we don't just leave it at the imperative. Our faithful, ethical compass, what we should do, what we should not do, goes hand in hand and is rooted on our theological rigor. Here's, I don't want you to stop there and think, man, Tim says I just got to do more, I got to do more. I know that's many of your personalities. Stop it. Here's the most important thing about that fight. We don't fight it alone. We don't fight it on our own. We fight it in light of eternity in Christ's strength. That's why he moves on to the next command. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold, command number four, of eternal life. So this this take hold, we've got to talk about this for a moment. This is a violent word in the Greek. This is to grasp firmly and forcibly to make it your own. I mean, let me give you two examples just to kind of paint a word picture here. Matthew 14, 31. You're familiar with the scene where Jesus is in the boat. Peter walks up to him. Matthew 14, 31. 
Is it up there? Should be. There you go. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What's going on here? Peter is sinking, about to drown in the Sea of Galilee. You think Jesus is going to gingerly grab his fingers? He grasps him and holds him because he will not let him sink. Same word, Acts 21.30. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. You think that sounds passive? Paul's using the same word here. For seizing eternal life, holding on to it, and do not let go. Like Jesus held on to Peter. Why? Why is that so important? You may ask, how can we hold on to something that can't be held? How can we hold on to something we don't possess yet? Ah, but we do. So, this is why verbs are important. This one is a completed action. Taking hold of what is already yours. Taking hold, we are not reaching out so that we can possess it for the first time. We are holding on to what has already been given us. How does that make you think about fleeing from sin and pursuing righteousness? You do it in light of the eternity that is already yours. In this fight, eternal life is the gold medal. It is the finish line. It is the crown. And saints, you have it right now in Christ. Amen? How do you think about running if the gold medal has already been won? How free are you to sprint when the competition, our Savior, has blown everyone else away? And He has accomplished it for us. You're not reaching out to grab something you don't have. You are holding on for dear life what has been purchased for you. This is the already not yet of eternal life. We hold on in faith to eternal life. We already have that. It is yours right now in Christ through faith. But the not yet is we eagerly await to we'll see it face to face. And I think it's worth noting that eternal life is not quantity but quality. Have you ever thought about that? I think for most of us, our immediate thought goes, oh, eternal life just means a long time. No, this is a qualitative, beautiful life that goes on for all time. How do we know that? That's what Jesus told us in John 17. The quality of life is this blessed, restored union with God. Let's see what Jesus tells us. I don't want you to just think about, oh, we go to heaven and it seems like a very long time, and that's my hope. Your hope is not time your hope is who that life is and that life being with him. Here's what Jesus says. Uh, John 17, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may, have glory, may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Think about it. That is the prize. That is the destination. That is what we have right now. If you know Jesus Christ, if you know God the Father who sent him, you have eternal life. And no one can take that from you. No one can snatch that out of your hand. And you get to see him face to face one day in all glory, in all splendor, in all comfort, in all joy, in all peace, in all harmony, forever. The Lord of glory says, come be with me. Look upon my glory forever. That's the view we have when we flee our sin and we pursue righteousness. The eternal weight of glory. So when Paul says to Timothy here, Hold on, take hold to the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession, to which this is the purpose of the price paid for you. 
Eternal life, that's why Christ came. That's why he died. That's his purpose. And when you were called, this shows us that it's divine initiation, divine confirmation, and completion. So there's an, there, there's an internal witness, the calling of the Heavenly Father to his spiritual children, and then about which you made the good confession. There's an external. This in the Greek is literally confessed the good confession. To put the emphasis in the repetition. It was the good confession that you confessed. Internally, you know that you were called. Externally, you said it among many witnesses. This is the purpose of a public confession. He is reassuring Timothy step after step after step. So now there's a lot of confusion on um, what is being said here and the, the next few verses. Um, I think the best explanation, it makes sense, is um, what was this good confession that he confessed? And what were the many witnesses? Um, there's a pattern in the early church and throughout church history to make a public confession at your baptism. Um, and this follows a creedal formula. And this is, this is kind of condensed. When I think about a creedal formula, I think of the Apostles' Creed. Um, and we'll, we'll look at this more next week. But I, I want you to see this, this uh, pattern here because it's, it, it seems out of place to say that the good confession that you confess in many witnesses, uh, excuse me, in the presence of many witnesses, and I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus who made the testimony before Pontius Pilate. Like what? What does all that have to do, God the giver of life and Jesus making his testimony before Pontius Pilate? Let's look at the Apostles' Creed, which we don't know when it's dated, but we know that the ideas and the, the, the traditions go on to the earliest days of the church. Timothy's public confession looks much like ours. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Every one of those creedal formulas always has Pontius Pilate there. It roots him in history. Was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Emphasizing Timothy's confession, he draws attention to Christ's confession before Pilate. So let's look at a couple things there. So before we go on to verse 14, or verse, verse 13, excuse me, why is... Paul saying all these things. Take hold. Remember your calling. Remember your good confession. Remember the many witnesses. Why? Ministry is difficult. Timothy, like every pastor, needs reminders of the evidences of God's grace. He needs reminders of everlasting life. He needs reminders of, of, of election. He needs reminders like you will profess these things publicly and your brothers or sisters are right there with you. How much easier would it be to persevere in the Christian life if we did that regularly, take hold of eternal life. Remember our calling. Remember our good confession. Remember the saints, the, 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 the many witnesses. If we held tightly, we remember that ourselves. How easy would it be to shed sin and pursue righteousness? We all need those reminders. Because if it was just flee and pursue, if it was just sanctification, if there's no justification, it's exhausting and it's impossible. If it's just what we do, if it's just our running, our, our fighting, it's hopeless. But it's not. We run and we fight out of what Christ has done for us. Praise God. We have an unfading hope that is ours in Christ. And that frees us up to run well and to leave behind our sin and pursue righteousness. And so as Paul goes on here in verse 13, you made a good confession before many witnesses. Now I am charging you from the presence of those many witnesses to the presence of the true and living God. Everything we say in front of others this is where I began is before the presence of God. How much more so is the pastoral charge given to Timothy? He says the same thing in verse 21 of chapter 5. 
Now, there are two parenthetical statements before we get to the next command. Parenthetical means there's a parenthesis, it's bits of, of, of information. I want to read the Apostles' Creed first to help you with this. Because he goes from one command to the next command to the next command, and then he's got these, these uh, phrases. Again, we'll spend more time on this next week. Who gives life to all things? So that's one parenthetical statement. If you forgot who God was, he's the one who gave you your life. And he's the one who sent you the Son to give you spiritual life. The second who, Christ, who in his testimony, literally here, in his witness. He's drawing attention to Timothy, who made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses, and Christ, who um, in his witness before Pontius Pilate, made a good confession. So he's he's saying all this before he gets to the next command to say, don't forget whose you are. Don't forget the Father who gave you life and the Son who is faithful in his witness so that you may have life. Let's look at that. Revelation 1.5. Revelation 1.5. As John writes the revelation to the churches, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the King of Kings, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Don't forget his witness. What was his witness? Let's look at John 18. John 18, here is Jesus before Pilate. It's nothing extravagant, but it is profound, and it is true, and it is piercing to everyone who hears these words. So Pilate entered his headquarters. This is John 18, 33. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests had delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. We have no lasting city here. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's it. That's Jesus' faithful witness. I came to bear the truth. I came to point you to my Father, and if you listen to me, you belong to me. It is Jesus' good confession that led to his crucifixion, his death, and it was confirmed in his resurrection and in his ascension. And by that good confession, that gives credence to Timothy's confession at his baptism. It is our faith in his good confession that is the root of our confession. One more text. This is the hope of our baptism, that it unites us to him. Romans 10. Um, I, I had to go here. Romans 10, 8 through 13. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe that? Have you confessed that? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one is confessed and saved. You cannot, this is not empty lip service. You can't just say it because it sounds good and you're around other Christians. Your heart must actually believe this. Justification must first take place in our heart. And then what is in us can't help but jump out. That is the confession that Paul is speaking about here. That is the confession that Timothy made. That was the confession that was made possible. Because Jesus Christ's kingdom is not of this world, so he gave up his life freely so that all who hear him will become witnesses to the truth and believe in him and have eternal life. He goes on. For the, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all 
bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is eternal life. Salvation in Jesus Christ. Knowing him. That's it. And out of that salvation, because of who has called us and what he has called us to, we run from sin. And we pursue righteousness. That is what Paul is speaking about here in verse 14. We're going to land here. Last command. And to keep the commandment. Just like there is one faith, there is uh, one set of orthodoxy. He is, bringing, he is unifying message and ministry here. To keep the commandment unstained and free from approach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until Christ returns, remain steadfast to what he has called you and to where he has called you. Keep that commandment. Keep your, your, your ministry. Keep what has been given to you unstained and free from reproach. Be faithful. Be above reproach. How do you do that? How can a Christian do that? How can we be faithful? How can we be unstained? It's impossible. We look back to the cross and we look forward to the consummation. We look back to the cross and we look forward to his coming. We look back to our pierced Savior and we look, we look forward to our glorious King. So brothers and sisters, hold on to new life. Grasp it with everything you have. Practice it. Work it out. Fight in it. And it will sustain you. It will encourage you until he comes. And when will he come? At the proper time. Whenever God decrees it right. And so how long are we to fight this good fight? As long as we are here and until we see Christ face to face. And in case you think Paul thinks lightly of this, he just spontaneously breaks out into doxology. He who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. If you realize what you have, you should break out into song all the time. Um, Paul puts this whole passage together and describes his ministry in 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. As he's approaching the last of his days, Timothy, or Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Can we say that? This is his aim. Remember, this is how he holds on to eternity right here. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, praise God, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Brothers and sisters, that is yours if you are in Christ. The crown of glory that he is keeping for you. Do you love his appearing? Are you looking for his next appearing? Then take heart. So three very quick points of conclusion, and then we'll prepare to approach the table. As we begin, the Christian spends his life before the face of God. If we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, the sovereign Lord of the universe, unless on our failures or our successes, we will run our race unhindered. Pursue Him. Leave the old man behind. How do we do that? Number two, brothers and sisters, you have eternal life. Hold on to it. Forcefully, steadfastly, violently. And we don't fight this good fight apart from Christ. And it is because of the life we have in Him. And because of the faith that He has given us, according to His grace, that we will fight the fight until He returns. And lastly, if you can't make that confession today, if you've mumbled empty words with your lips, but your heart is far from Him, if you do more running to sin than pursuing Christ, today is the day of salvation. Turn to Him. Cry out to Him. 
Flee from your sin and run to him. But, but because without him and without eternal life, you are doomed. Cut your hand off, cut your foot off, cut your eye off, that you may live rather than be whole and perish. If you need prayer for anything, I'd love to pray with you. There are many here who love to pray with you. So I'll give you a few moments to prepare your hearts and minds, and then I will lead us to the table.